interest in Muslim Christian relations, conflict and conflict resolution and the political history and trends in the African church with a focus on Ghana. He is known for preaching on topics such as the authenticity of the Bible, the existence of God, resurrection, and common objections of Muslims to the Christian faith. So before I hand it over to uh, Brother Ibrahim, I'm just going to ask you guys once again to direct your questions to Slido. The password is I am, capital I, capital A, capital M, and we will be having a Q&A session at the end of his message. So like I said, sharing the gospel with our Muslim friends, um, and this is where it gets interactive. Now, I'll begin with a video and I want you, you would, I'm, I'm asking this question. How will you respond to your Muslim friends who make the following claims? Who makes the following claim? Now, let, let, let's listen to this video. What was Jesus? In the Quran, Jesus is called Nabi. But then he was more than that. He was a Rasul. 124,000 prophets, Nabi. 315 Rasul, messengers. So Jesus was a Nabi and a Rasul, like many prophets. Muhammad was a Nabi and a Rasul. Moses was a Nabi and a Rasul. Isa, a Nabi and a Rasul. But there is something about Jesus. I have looked and I have not found this title except with Jesus. In the Quran, Jesus is referred to 11 times with this title. Al-Masih. Al-Masih. 11 times in the Quran. No other prophet called Al-Masih. What does Christ mean, anointed? Muslims think that Christians take their name from Jesus. They don't take their name from Jesus. They're called Christians. They take their name from the anointed one. In Hebrew, it would be Mas Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Do Jews believe in Jesus as the prophet? No. Do Jews believe in Jesus as a Messiah? No. Why don't they believe in him as a Messiah? He didn't do the job of the Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to come and bring peace on the earth. He didn't do it, so he's not the Messiah. But why must Jesus come back? Whom the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews worship. Because Allah said in the Quran, uh, Ilahuna wa ilahukum wahid. Your God and our God is one. Our God and your God is one. There's only one God. We, we, we come time, we get it wrong, you know. Why? Because we're people of faith. We believe. We believe, you believe, and we believe. Allah said in the Quran, and God does whatever he wants to do. Now look throughout history and see how Allah, God, has saved his prophets. Moses, he saved them from Pharaoh in a miraculous way. He saved the children of Israel. They went across the Red Sea and he drowned Pharaoh and the, uh, his soldiers. Look at Abraham. Abraham was about to be thrown in the fire. And Allah ordered the fire to be cool. Abraham didn't die in the fire. Why? Allah does what he pleased. Everyone tonight agree that God can do whatever he wants. True. But hasn't God Almighty allowed some prophets to be murdered? It's in the Quran. Some prophets were murdered. It's in the Torah. It's in the Bible. The cousin of Jesus, what was his name? Yahya, uh, um, John, John the Baptist. It's reported that he was murdered. He was beheaded. Other prophets had died. God not able to save them? Of course he was. He was able to save them, but he didn't. Why? For his reason. His reasons are beyond us. This is what makes him who he is. We, you know... I was uh, uh, at the airport, and um, I had just come back from, uh, from a trip in the Guadi airport, and I got a cab, and the cab driver was listening to a, a radio station, and a, and a preacher was preaching, and I'm listening to the sermon, and the preacher says something like this, well, if, if I were God, I would have done it this way. And I said, no, if you were God, you'd do the same way God did it, because that's what making God. You see, we, I mean, we're right. We, the, so why did God do it that way? Not only did Allah save Jesus, but he saved them in a very special way. He raised them up to himself. And Jesus is in heaven 
One of the things that Jesus called in Quran, Allah mentions in the Quran, uh, uh, that Jesus is a sign of the sa'ah, of the hour. Jesus is a sign of the hour. And according to our tradition of our Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, the day of judgment will not happen until there are some signs and one of the signs is the return of Jesus. Muslims absolutely believe in the return of Jesus. Jesus has to come. Why? He has to fulfill the Messiah. He has to come and Jesus will be a just ruler. It's there. We believe it. See, we're not hiding it. Jesus will come to this earth as a just ruler. Why? He's al Masih. He is the Messiah. And it will come about and Jesus will come about, and he's not going to teach a new teaching. It's going to be the same teaching that we have, the teaching of the last book of Al-Quran. And Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him, will bring about justice on this earth. And according to what our prophet taught us, peace and blessing be upon him, there is no more difficult trial to human beings than what is called Adajal, what you call the Antichrist. The Antichrist is real. He will bring havoc on this earth, called the Antichrist. And lo and behold, who will put an end to the Antichrist? Is Jesus. My question is, having seen this video, how would you respond to a Muslim who, who makes a assertion, who makes a claim, who makes a certain claim as this uh, Muslim scholar is making in this video, how would you respond to that person? So this is practical. I, I want to hear you. You've gone out to share the gospel and, and something like this come up. How, how would you respond to it? Um, I think I would be too scared to respond to such claim because they seem to know a lot. And I, I think I would just dig myself a hole and never be able to come out if I was Wow. To <laughs> oh, Sharon, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> thank you for your honesty. Um, that, that is the essence of what we are doing here um, today. I, I intended to make it practical. I, I don't want to be talking alone. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, any other person? If, if you are going to talk to a Muslim and he begins to say, oh, we believe in the same thing. Oh, we believe in Jesus. And, and he says the things that this man is saying and all that. How would you, how would you engage? Oh, uh, Sneha, do, 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 what, what will you do in such a situation? Um, I think I, I might off the bat be like, okay, well, they're not the same. I might be like, you know, maybe from my limited knowledge, maybe tell them the difference with differences between what they're saying and the Jesus that we serve, maybe. So do, do, what will you say? I think I would engage them with the truth, confront them with what we know. Okay, so so basically, what what would have been your response? I, I, I want to see you practically. How will you do that? I think I would probably um, uh, like Muslims. They have different perceptions of who Jesus is. Actually, um, I don't think they believe that he resurrected or anything like that. So maybe I would bring up the fact about Jesus's resurrection, why he did it. Um, yeah, and obviously he, he did it to save others. Okay, that's, 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 that's good. Um, but let me ask you this. Are there things that this man, this Muslim scholar says in the video that you find to be true? Are there things that you find to be true that he says about Jesus that you affirm? Are the statements, are the things that he said true or they are false? I believe that the things he mentioned about the second coming are true to what we believe in, about uh, Jesus Christ defeating the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I believe is true. Okay. Any, any other person? Um, Noel? Yeah, 
Yeah, I agree. I think there's few things that he said which are true, which are, which it would be which is the same as we believe in. But but are there are there things that you found to be also um, contradictory to our beliefs? Uh, well, I I didn't I clearly hear, but I think I think he said something at the start about how the Messiah is the one who comes and brings peace. Mm. And uh, the, but that's not what, what the Messiah we believe is not the one who brings peace. It's the one who saves us from what we were from the depths of sin. And that is the Messiah we believe in. That he comes to save us, not to bring peace. I think that's the only place we differ from what they believe in. Exactly, exactly. That is that is a very good point. That is a very good point you are making. And so you find that. So guys, when you are engaging with Muslims, you need to listen. One of the, one of the key qualities that you need to develop as, um, as evangelists, as ministers of the gospel, is the ability to listen and listen carefully. Because it is not every time, like Sharon pointed out, this man seems to know a lot about the Christian faith. And he seems to bring that across. And so if you don't know your scriptures very well, as uh, Noel has pointed out, and uh, you might think that the kind of things that he's saying, actually, um, they are true. And so you wouldn't want to contest some of the things that he's saying. But there is a lot of smoke screen along some of the things that he's saying. Largely, majority of the things that he said is true. Christ means anointed. But Messiah is not just someone who brings peace. It's a savior. And the question is, if Jesus is savior, then what does he save us from? And that is, that is the point that um, you pointed out, which is extremely critical. So there are things he's saying that are true, but it is not the entire truth. And we need to engage, we need to interrogate those issues. So the things that he affirms to be true in the Christian faith, we call them point of contact. That is where you begin the conversation from. You need to question him. You need to interrogate the issues that he is raising and how to engage and point him to the truth. So, Sharon, you don't have to run away. You need to ask yourself the things that this man is saying, the claims that, and so on and so forth, the claims that he is making are there things that I should ask further questions about. If Jesus is Messiah, what is the meaning of Messiah? He's a savior. What is he going to save us from? If he brought peace, that is true. Of course, Isaiah's prophecy clearly says that for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and, and, and the government would be upon his shoulder. And various names were given. He'd be a wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, the everlasting God. You know, So there are many, many things that is said about Christ that we can affirm, but it is much more beyond what he is saying. And I think that if he says that, for example, if, you, if I'm engaging this person and he says that, you know, Jesus is going to come again, it is true. But is Jesus' second coming going to be, and there is, there is a point that he made, the judgment of God will not happen until Christ returns. And there is much more to it than that. Jesus is actually going to be the one who is going to judge. You see? And so there are things that you need to engage with the person as he is bringing up these issues. You need to listen. So he talks about judgment. Jesus is going to judge. He talks about signs of the end times, which is true. But what did Jesus say about the end times? Did Jesus, he says that Jesus did not fulfill his, his mandate, his divine mandate. Is it true that Jesus did not fulfill his divine mandate? What does the Bible say? What did Jesus say actually are the signs that will show us his second coming? And what is the purpose of Jesus' second coming? That is how you need to engage. So there are points of truth that are being raised here, and we can't rubbish them. But there is something much more. And so when Muslims come across with something of this nature, we can engage them, but we need to raise questions to the issues that they are raising. 
I will move on to uh, the next slide. Now, this session I call it um, emergency apologetics, answering common objections. So there are some, I mean, it's, these are not my own questions. Um, in my studies, in my preparation, there are a few things that I saw and I felt, well, this would be good for us to kind of wrap our minds around it a bit and, and see. Uh, and so there are a few questions which I'm going to ask you I mean, assuming that Muslims, you are engaging a Muslim and they are asking you these questions, um, how would you go about it? And I want you to respond to some of these questions as I, as I show them on the screen. Now, the first question which I want to ask you is this. What do you think about Muhammad? What do you think about Muhammad? Um, Anyone at all can, can answer. This is an interactive session. So guys, I want you to talk to me. What do you think about Mohammed? I mean, your opinion, it doesn't have to be a right or wrong answer. Let's just hear you. What do you think about him? As far as I know, I know he's a prophet. Mm -hmm. that's what I know about him, that he's a prophet and that's what Muslims believe he is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's have one more. Um, if I'm right, he received the Quran? Yeah, that's true. Yes. So, I mean, those, 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 are, those, are, those are obviously things about him that we can say. But what do you think about the Quran? I think it's a book uh, may, made out of uh, you know little scripts taken from the Jewish Jewish literature, uh, you know, primarily okay. the gospel, and so it's a mishmash of different stuff. Okay. I don't uh, let's take. The word of God. Okay, you you don't believe it's the word of God. Okay. Um, Let's have one more. I think it's the holy book of Muslims, just like how the Bible is our, uh, the book that we are supposed to follow. Okay. Now my next question is, why haven't you become a Muslim? <laughs> you, want, you want Muslims to become Christians. Why haven't you become one if someone should ask you? Why do you want me to be a Christian and you don't want to be a Muslim? Uh, Marin? Marin, do you want to attempt that? Uh, I think uh, it might be because we are supposed to be the, uh, the generations coming from uh, Israel and the true the, uh, God's will. And they were supposed to be the generations coming from uh, Hagar. And I think that is the differentiation. I'm not sure. Okay. That, that is the reason why you are not a Muslim. Okay, let, let's have one more. Jesus Christ uh, brought the true light into the world. Okay, so Jesus. the truth in him. Okay. Jesus Christ. Um, or the true light, and, and so we find the truth in him. Okay. Um, any other person? I think I saw, was it Aaron? Your hand was up, but you lowered it anyway. Does someone want to attempt one more? You go to evangelize. You are sharing the gospel with a Muslim, and he says that, why do you want me to be a, a Christian? Why don't you also become a Muslim? Um, what will you say? <laughs> I believe as Christians, we know the truth. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's why I, I haven't become a Muslim till now. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask my last question. Was Muhammad prophesied in the Bible? Asaf, Asaf, talk to me. <laughs> I can see your response, but I want to hear your voice, Asaf. 
Yes, and he has a double. I'm not sure if I can really answer this question, but, but I, I can I just say it. No. I would think it says it's uh, indirectly. It is uh, it's talked about him. Um, anything that and uh, it says like an angel of light. And from my interaction with Muslims being born and brought up in a Muslim country, uh, many of them are good Muslims, and they and also having interacted with Muslim colleagues. Um, it's almost so believable. It's like you say, nine, it's, if you don't know your Bible well enough, it's like 95% to 98% you're bound to start down, doubting yourself. So they, you need to know what exactly. But I would say, it's, if not him in particular, it does say about as an angel of light. So I believe it's everybody who comes under that category. Everybody and anything that comes under that category. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. Aaron, let, let's hear from Aaron and then let's see. So you don't believe that he was prophesied in the Bible. Okay. All right. So I'm going to show you. I mean, I'm not saying that if you meet a Muslim and they, they bring this question to you, this is how to answer it. But I'm going to see when people ask you a question, first of all, your knowledge your knowledge about um, Islam, some of the things that you know about Islam would, would help would help to some extent how you navigate some of these questions when they come up. And so I'm not saying that this is, a, this is the way to go about it, but always have this at the back of your mind that you are, you are trying to witness to Christ. It is Jesus that you want to bring to the saving knowledge of um, of people. So as much as possible, you would want to direct the conversation in that direction. You want to move the conversation in that way. And so um, I just want you to be on the lookout. Now, this is, this is how. So I teased out these questions from um, a book by Edward um, Hoskins, Encountering the World of Islam. But look at how we are supposed to engage if people ask us some of these questions. And I just want you to observe a few things. I will ask you some questions later. Now, the question, what do you think about Muhammad? Now, look at the response. It says, you know that Muhammad is not my prophet. He is yours. Although I do not believe exactly what you believe about him, I do respect him. Politically, he was a reformer. So I asked you, what do you think about Muhammad? Some of you were saying some of these things. But this, this person says, politically, he was a reformer, a statesman, and a national leader. Religiously, he called idolatrous people back to worship the one true God. He also said many positive things about my Lord Jesus. I believe each of these reasons makes him worthy of my respect. Now, have you seen how the conversation has gone? So the person affirms something about Muhammad that they know, but the person also turns the conversation on to who? To Jesus, that Muhammad says many positive things about the Lord Jesus. I believe each of these reasons make him worthy of my respect. Now, if assuming that you are a Muslim, I say this thing to you that Muhammad says many positive things about Jesus. And these are the reasons that make him worthy of my respect. What do you think is likely to happen from this response, from this feedback? Um, if you are listening, if, if you are engaging with me in an evangelism session, and then I say, I believe Muhammad says many positive things about Jesus. What do I, you would think be more, I think I would be more interested in I would think, I think that will kind of put me off balance in a way, like, but I will think that, okay, something I'll be more open to be listening to what you have to say. Precisely, Rosalind, precisely. There is, a, see, there, there, is, there, is a, there is a bit of curiosity in this question. So that, therefore, if the Muslim has not known that the kind of things that Muhammad has said about Jesus, then the question would be, Rosalind, if I follow you, what does he, what did he say about Jesus? 
that is where the curiosity is. And you are being invited now to talk about Jesus. And mm -hmm. talking about Jesus is the sharing of the gospel. Yes, amen. Good word. Mm -hmm. and, and that is precisely what you are seeking to do. Now, let's take the second question. It says, what do you think about the Quran? Now look at it. it says, since I am a Christian, you know that the Quran is not my book, it is yours. Although I don't believe exactly what you believe about the Quran, I do read it. I appreciate it because of the many wonderful and beautiful things it says about my Lord, Messiah, Jesus. Have you seen that consistently in all two responses, the conversation has shifted to who? To Jesus. In all two responses, and, and the writer is very, very honest. And, and this, is, this, is, this, is the, this is the habit. This is the habit I want you to have. You should be sincere. If you have not read the Quran, don't say you have read it. If you have only read a few verses, say I've read a few verses about Jesus. But he says, I'm a Christian. And so, so there's a disclaimer there. I'm a Christian and you know that the Quran is not my holy book, it is yours. I, although I don't believe exactly what you believe about the Quran, I, I read it. I appreciate it because of the many wonderful sins it says about Jesus. Guys, what I'm saying is that, this is, this is the essence of the, of, of, of the training. I am not saying that these are the answers to give to any Muslim that you are engaging with. But what I am trying to get you to understand is that when you are talking to someone, especially of the other face, who is not a Christian or a Muslim, whatever it is, make sure that your conversation is drawing attention to the gospel and that is jesus it is jesus you want people to know it is jesus that so they will have some objections here and there you will try to explain but always make sure that the center of attraction is bringing is 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 is, is christ now let's see about the third question why haven't you become a muslim and this is why i say your some knowledge about islam would help look at the response you know that I am a Christian, which means I'm not a follower of your religion, your prophet, or your book. However, if you are using the word Muslim, which means surrender in its truest sense, as, as one who is surrendered to God, then I am already that. You see, Islam comes from the root word, which means peace, purity, obedience, and submission. So a Muslim, in essence, is someone who has submitted or surrendered to God. So if the person is saying Muslim in that sense of the word, you can take the meaning in, in that subversive sense and say that if that is what you mean as someone who has surrendered to God, then I am. Okay, he says, I have surrendered my life to God and have been made complete completely clean through his mighty blood sacrifice of Messiah Jesus. You see, so here also, so consistently you see that throughout these responses, the gospel is being preached. Jesus is being pointed to. And then let's, let's look at the fourth question. Was Muhammad prophesied in the Bible? And look at the response. I do believe that Jesus, I do believe that God in the Bible prophesied about a very special prophet who would come in the future. A few prophecies could be confused with Muhammad. However, there are more than 300 prophecies which are very specific. As I have studied them, I believe there is only one person who could and did fulfill each of them, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. Sometimes, would you like to Look at a few of these prophecies. So now you are, you are inviting the Muslim to look at some of these prophecies. Have you seen? And so in all four questions, you realize that attention is being drawn to Jesus Christ. Jesus is being pointed to as the ultimate source, as the ultimate answer to some of these things. And one of the best ways to engage Muslim as far as the prophecies are concerned, who fulfilled the prophecies are concerned, is to invite them to read the Gospel of Matthew with you. 
Now remember that Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience and his main focus was to show that the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Muslims will not accept the New Testament readily, but they accept the Old Testament prophecies. So they, are, they, are, they, are, they, they, they accept the Psalms, they accept the, the prophets, you know. And so one of the books that does that for you in a very good way is the Gospel of Matthew. Because you will find that Matthew's account would always, said, would always say that so that what was said about the prophet will come to pass. Let me give you an example of one or two of Matthew's prophecies that clearly was pointing to what the prophets have said. And so, sorry, 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 sorry. Matthew chapter 4. Let's read from verse 12. Let's read from verse 12 and see how it talks about Jesus. It says, now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee and, re and, leaving, Ga and, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah must be fulfilled. So that what was spoken by which prophet? Isaiah must be fulfilled. And what was Isaiah's prophecy about, about Jesus Christ? And this is, this is what he says. Now, pay attention. He says, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who dwell in the region and, the, and, and for those who dwell in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Have you seen? So Jesus' movement, even to this area to live, was a fulfillment of prophecy by Isaiah. And so it is instructive how Matthew tries to point out these happenings to us that it is not happening by accident. It is a fulfillment of prophecy. And there are many others like that. Even in Jesus' best, you know, when he was born and when his parents had to flee to Bethlehem and all, uh, to Egypt and all that, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Even the killing of the children who um, Herod sought to destroy, he thinking that by doing that, he would destroy Jesus, was a fulfillment of prophecy. Let me give you two more examples. So let's go to Matthew chapter 2. Now let's look at, uh, let's read from Matthew chapter 2. Let's read from verse 1 to verse 6. This is what the Bible says. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his stars when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophets. Have you seen? And for so it is written by the prophet. And this is what the prophecy says. And you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Prophecy fulfilled by Jesus. Every time throughout the life of Jesus, prophecy is fulfilled. Now, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, when his parents had to flee to Egypt so that Herod would not destroy him. This is what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 13. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. It is a fulfillment of prophecy. And so you see that what this person is saying is true. 
However, there are more than 300 prophecies which are very specific as I've stated them. I believe there is only one person who could and did fulfill each of them, the Messiah Jesus, son of Mary, sometimes. And now he's inviting the Muslims to come and have a treat. Sometimes, would you like to look at a few of these prophecies? And you can invite it. And, and one of the ways to witness to Muslims is, is to use the scriptures, to read the scriptures with them. And the Gospel of Matthew is an amazing, amazing text where you begin to show them what has been prophesied about Jesus and how, was, how those prophecies were fulfilled. It is extremely important. We can go on and on and on about the prophecies of Jesus. Beloved in the Lord, this is one way to engage. It's, it's one of the ways. So yes, your responses, I appreciate your responses, but please let your focus, your conversation and everything be around the person of Christ. Now let's look at Islam and Christianity. You see, there are many times that we are, some of us can be confused to think that, and I like, this, I like what Rosalind said, we, you can be confused to think that actually we are worshiping the same God. And if you don't know your Bible carefully, that confusion can arise. If you don't know your Bible carefully, that, that confusion can arise because there are similarity of beliefs. And before we go to how to witness to Muslims, I think that you need to know some of these things so that it will inform your engagement with Muslims. And, and I just want to point out a few of these. You see, Islam is one of the religions that shares the same affinity with Christianity. It shares some commonality of beliefs with us. What are some of those? You see, first of all, they are all religions that descended from Abraham. Now, in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 28, the Bible tells us Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, sorry, um, Isaac and Ishmael. And then it goes on to tell us the descendant of Ishmael. He also had 12 sons who formed the 12 tribes, you know, of the Muslim world. So they all descended from Abraham. Therefore, they are called the Abrahamic faith. So when we talk about the Abrahamic faith, we are talking about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now remember that. Um, Christianity came out of Judaism, if you like, because the early Christians were Jews. Peter and his brothers and his friends were Jews, right? Um, later on, others came to faith. But Christianity, the word Christianity, we get that from Acts chapter 11, verse 26. That was where the, the term was first used. Because we are told that the manner of life of the, of, the, of the disciples resembled that of Jesus. And so they were first called Christians in Antioch, right? And Christians, it was a nickname like Little Christ. And so it is extremely important. So these three religions come from what is called the Abrahamic faith. But not only that, they share similarity of beliefs in terms of sacred books, prophets, um, beliefs in the day of judgment, uh, salvation, the presence of hell, the day of resurrection of the dead, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to take you briefly, quickly, some of these beliefs um, that they share. Now, there are six Islamic beliefs, also known as the Articles of Faith. Now, Muslims believe, they be first of all, we believe in God, they believe in God. We believe that there is a supreme God who exists, who is the creator of the universe and all that. But for Muslims, they say that God is one. Yes, there is God, but he is one. He is the only one that exists. You can't associate partners with Allah. Allah is the only um, supreme deity in existence. And so to associate partners with Allah is to commit the unpardonable sin, which is punishable with death. Um, because you say that Allah and some other beings are with him. So they believe in the oneness of God, which is called Tawheed. Then they believe in prophets. Muslims believe that they are prophets. There are 124,000 of them. And how each of them related to Allah, I will highlight some of the prophets a bit more, are there. And, and the Arabic term for the prophet is Nabi or An-Nabi. 
right, which means prophets. So they believe in prophets. The Quran recognizes 25 of them, but there are 124,000 of these prophets. Um, Muslims believe in angels and other supernatural beings. We Christians also believe that the angels exist. They are evil spirit and, uh, and, and other spirit beings in existence in our world. Muslims believe that too. The, the Arabic term for an angel is malaika, right? So they believe in angels, they are malaika Jibreel, malaika Mikhail. They believe in evil spirit. They believe in genes, that the genes are there. There are good genes and there are bad genes. If any of you have watched the movie Aladdin before, Jenny wants you to make a wish, three wishes. They are spirit beings and Muslims believe that they exist. Um, good genes are handsome and, and, and beautiful and they can help you achieve certain things. Um, there are bad genes also. They are ugly and evil. Genes can, can transform themselves into animate and inanimate objects. They can turn to trees, they can turn to dogs, they can turn to birds or stones. You know, they believe that angels also exist. Just as we believe that angels exist, demons also exist. They believe in scriptures and the scriptures that Muslims believe in is the Quran, uh, they also have other books. Um, the Hadith is there, and, and other books are also in existence, which they hold to be authoritative. But the most authoritative of all books is the Quran. Now, Muslims also believe in the Day of Judgment, which is called Yom al Qiyamah, the Day of Resurrection, or Yom al Hisab, which is the Day of Reckoning or Yom al-Din, which is the day of judgment. They believe that we will all stand before God's judgment throne and be judged. Now, you see, these commonality of beliefs are important. They are important in the sense that they can be, they can be the bridges where we can start conversation from. But when we begin to dig deeper into it, you will realize that what the Bible says is totally different from what the Quran says. And we need to engage with Muslims on, on, these, on these issues. And then they believe in, that in, in predestination. Muslims believe that whatever happens in our lifetime, you know, whether good or evil has already been decreed by Allah, you know, um, and so they believe that that is there. It's been written on tablet in, in heaven and it's, it's, it's unchangeable, it's immutable, right? So it, it, it is something to pay attention to. Um, but not only that. So let me highlight a bit more about the prophet. And so the way the prophets served Allah or related to Allah, the Islam also recognizes them as such. Adam, which is the first created human being in the Garden of Eden, is seen as a prophet in it for Muslims. Is he is the chosen of Allah? It means Safiullah, Noah. He is seen as Nabiullah, the preacher of Allah. If you take Abraham, he's seen as Khalilullah, the friend of Allah. If you take Moses, he's seen as Kalimullah, the converser with Allah. If you take Muhammad, he is seen as Rasulullah, the messenger, an apostle of Allah, a messenger of Allah. But when it comes to Jesus, Jesus is seen in, in, in some unique ways. Jesus is seen as Kalimatullah, his word. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding this um, in Muslim circles, you know, whether it's capital W or small w, but the Quran says Jesus is the word. It actually affirms what the scriptures say in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And, and then it goes on to highlight all these things, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. No one has seen the father except the son who was with the father. He has revealed him to us. The Quran equally affirms other unique, you know, miracles that Jesus performed. So he is the word of God. Surah chapter 4, verse 35. Surah 345 says that he is the Messiah. He, his virgin birth is testified to. The Quran affirms the fact that Jesus will bring all people to himself. He, he, the Quran also affirms the miracles of Jesus. Um, the Quran affirms the death of Christ. Um, he died. He 
because Jesus begins, even in the cradle, Jesus was speaking. Jesus prophesies about he being raised from the dead um, when you read Surah al Maryam. And in Surah chapter 5, verse 110, Jesus created a bird out of clay and he breathed into the bird and the bird came alive. So actually, the power of creation is given to Christ. And all of these things that the Quran says is actually affirmed by the New Testament. The Quran also says Jesus is a spirit from Allah and he is the Messiah, the Savior. When you take the Quran, the, the sacred books, you will realize that there are certain books that um, are in the Quran. So uh, Moses is Moses, Moses, Moses is seen as a prophet. And the book that was given to Moses was the Torah, which is the law in, he in Hebrew is Torah. If you take David, David was given the Psalms in Arabic is Zabur. And Jesus was given the gospel in Arabic, which is the Injil. And so the Quran affirms these books and they are there in the Quran, which talks about Jesus and, and the kind of work that he did practices that Muslims are engaged in, which also has a certain similarity with the Christian faith. Well, the first one is the creed, the Shahada. For Christians, we believe in the creed. We believe in the Apostles' Creed. We believe in the Nicene Creed, and we recite it. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the God of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his Holy Son, our God, who was conceived by the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, and so on and so forth. We can go on and on. Muslims also have the creed. Now, to become a Muslim, you must recite the creed, which is the Shahada or Kalima to Shahada. Now, it is when a Muslim has recited the creed or has confessed the creed in faith, you can say that you are truly a Muslim or you have become a Muslim. And what is the creed? The creed is basically say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. When a Muslim child is born, one of the first things that the, 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 the child's parents or the father whispers into the ear of that child is the creed, La ilaha illallah, Ashad Allah ilaha illallah, Ashad Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. I confess that Muhammad, um, there, I confess that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Now, when a Muslim confesses this in faith, you have become a Muslim. This is the confession that you make and you become a Muslim. So they believe in the creed just as we do. Muslims pray, which is the Salat. They pray five times a day. So there are, there are five times compulsory prayers and other non-compulsory prayers. They believe in giving alms, giving of alms, and which is called zakat, to give a part of your income to the poor so that it can be the form of money. Now, if you are living in a, a, domin a dominant Muslim country, uh, this zakat is what Muslims use for Islamic missions and all that. Then they believe in fasting. Muslims fast for 30 days during the lunar month of Ramadan. You know, and the purpose of the fast is to ensure self-control. So Muslims do fast. And then they believe in pilgrimage. Go to Mecca. If you have the money and you are in good health, you have sound mind, you can embark on this pilgrimage to Mecca. But not only that, they also believe in jihad, the holy war. Now, various groups of Muslims have a different understanding of what jihad means. There are some Muslims who believe that your struggle with sin, you know, that your body is, is one, you want to please Allah, and, but there are so many temptations in this world, and so you are trying to please Allah, you are struggling with sin and all that. Uh, that kind of struggle is jihad. But we know that it's holy war against also um, people who have not believed in Islam and Muslims feel obligated to wage a holy war to bring people to, to, to Islam. This is just um, some of the beliefs that Muslims have, which sometimes have a, uh, some affinity to Christianity, but you know that we are not worshiping the same God. Because if you say that we are worshiping the same thing, then do Muslims believe that Jesus is God? 
Muslims believe that Jesus would judge the world? Do they believe that Jesus came to save them from their sins? Do they believe in the scriptures as we believe in? Those are critical issues that we cannot downplay. So now, um, how do you witness to Muslims? How do you share the gospel with Muslims? Beloved, I would say that evangelism or sharing the gospel with people of other faith is spiritual warfare. It's a battle that is waged in the realms of the spirit. So you begin with prayer. Prayer is the place where we discern the mind of God. Prayer is the place where we partner with the Holy Spirit to know what he is doing. Prayer is the place where we bring issues before God. And I like the fact that you were praying. Sneha was leading us to pray about a Muslim country. I believe that God was leading you to choose that. It's extremely important that, that we pray. We begin by prayer because it's spiritual warfare. Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, the scripture says that you cannot enter a strong man's house and plunder his household unless you first bind the strong man. And how do you do that? You don't do that physically. You do that on your knees. You begin to pray for Muslims who are, who are your colleagues in the workplace, Muslims who are your neighbors, Muslims who you are living with in the same country that God would bring them to his seven knowledge. God will begin to work on their heart. God will begin to draw them to you. You go to God in prayer, asking him to bring Muslims your way that you can share the gospel. You don't have the power to convert anyone. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a privilege to be used by him to accomplish his purposes. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says that, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against powers, principalities, rulers of darkness and wickedness, spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we begin with prayer. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of people that they will not know the light of the gospel. They cannot see the image of Christ. So what do we do? The only way that the spiritual blindfold can be removed is at the place of prayer. So we begin with prayer. Not only that, we must have love and compassion for lost souls. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, the scripture says that when Jesus saw the crowd, they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. But the key thing there before this statement was that he had compassion over them. Beloved, many of us have no compassion for lost souls. When we look at the life of certain people, the sinful life that they are living, some of us don't even want them to be saved. And that is not the way God wants us to live. No, that is not the way of God. God is willing to save the sinner. And if our heart is not broken for them, if we don't desire that they will come to the saving knowledge of Christ, there is no way you can share the gospel with them. Many of us have a lot of prejudices about Muslims. When you see Muslims on TV, when you see Muslims in your neighborhood, what do you think about them? How do you feel? What perceptions do you have? Sometimes our perceptions about Muslims prevent us from even opening our mouths to share the gospel with them. Many of us think that, oh, they are aggressive people. If I go to talk to him right now, they would not listen to me. Beloved, it took a Christian lady to bring me to the saving knowledge of Christ. Time will not allow me, but I would have shared my testimony. Maybe next time I will begin by sharing my testimony. But this lady came to share the gospel with me, and I came to face. Assuming that if she was thinking that, Look, um, Muslims are aggressive. Um, this guy, you know, I can't talk to him. He's a Muslim. He's going to argue with me and all that. I didn't even argue with her. God was already doing something in my heart. And he brought her just at the right time for me to make that decision. And today I'm happy I'm sharing the gospel with you. And I'm doing that gladly. But for that lady who, who shared the gospel with me. When we go, assuming that you have Muslim neighbors, 
there is a Muslim living next door to you. You want to share the gospel with them, but you know that one of them is not well. You can pay them a visit and, and ask to pray for them if they would want you to pray for them. Even if you can't go there, but they are next door, I'm going to you tell them, I'm going to pray about this issue with you. Can I pray with you right now? And sometimes when you pray with them, it, it can open up an opportunity, especially for Muslims. Some who believe that we are worshiping the same God will say, go ahead, pray for me. Even if they don't believe, when sometimes when you ask them to, to pray for them, they believe that, look, God will answer. And when you pray for them, God can use that to cause a miracle to happen. And beloved in the Lord, miracles open the door for the gospel to be shared. In Acts chapter 3, at the beautiful gate, the man who was crippled, he asked Peter for money, Peter and John, and they said, silver and gold, we have none. But in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. When they prayed for him in the name of Jesus, and the miracle happened, look at what the man did. He started jumping and shouting and praising God and running around. And many people saw the miracle that had happened and they rushed to the place. And Peter used that as an opportunity not to claim, raise attention for himself or to claim that the miracle has been done for him. But he pointed them to the source of the miracle, which, which, who was Christ. And he preached the gospel to them and they believed. And many were added to the number of believers. Miracles open the door for the gospel to be preached. Don't shy away from praying for your sick Muslim friends and neighbors. God can cause a miracle through that. And many things, it can lead to many things. Again, when you pray for Muslims in the name of Jesus, it can be a good opportunity for the gospel because you pray for them. And you end up by saying, we pray in the name of Jesus. And many Muslims sometimes will not say amen. Some will say amen and ask you a question. Why do you pray in the name of Jesus? Beloved, if any Muslim asks me why I pray in the name of Jesus, it is my golden opportunity to share the gospel with them. Because they are actually asking me, tell me about Jesus, why he is unique, and why you, 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 you pray in his name. And I will tell them about him and why we pray in the name of Jesus. When you are talking to Muslims, please show respect to the person and his or her religion that you care and are interested in future dialogue. You see, sometimes for us Christians, we make the mistake of attacking Muslims um, by saying, demeaning their religion, by putting them down, you know? And sometimes we come across as very arrogant, as people who are not sensitive. Please don't do that. Show respect to them. For example, when you're talking to a Muslim and you mention the name Muhammad, Muslims will say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam simply means peace be upon him. You can, you can also show respect. And I have found that sometimes some of this act of respect opens the door. Muslims see that you mention Muhammad's name, you say, peace be upon him and all that. They feel, they, they feel you, you, you are showing respect. And so when you respect the things that they respect, it opens them out to engage with you. So show respect. Don't put them down. Our father um, who has passed on, Ravi always says that you don't cut a person's nose and then give them a rose to smell. Don't condemn everything that they hold dear, you know, and, and, and then all in the name of wanting to you know, commend Jesus to them. No, don't do that. If there are things that are true, which they are, they are saying, affirm it and, and engage them. Use that as a bridge to engage with them. The next point, which I want you to know, is that seek to make friends with Muslims and show them love and concern present before presenting the gospel. Many of you are in, the, in, 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 in senior high schools, um, in the secondary school, and you have Muslim friends. Some of you are not friends with them, actually. They are your classmates, they are schoolmates, but they are not your friends. Befriend them, share your food with them, 
and be praying for them in your closet and pray that God would give you opportunity to share the gospel with them. You see, the thing with friendship is that, let me tell you this, Muslims believe that we Christians see them as objects of evangelism. When you have a relationship with them, when you have friends with them, that, that suspicion is broken. That suspicion that you see them as objects of evangelism is broken. Why? Because you are my friend. And I have always been sharing things with you. Um, we've been learning together. And sometimes um, you are in a classroom, your Muslim friend does not understand a particular subject, but you do. It is an opportunity to, to, to explain those things to them. Show them that you care. Show them love. Anybody whom you demonstrate love towards, they feel it and, and they open up and they share, they share their life with you. And that in itself can be an opportunity to share the gospel. For those of you who are working, who are adults working and other things in your workplace, you have a Muslim there who is your work colleague. Show them concern. Sometimes they have family problems, they have financial issues, they have others. Show them that you care. If you are in a position to help in any way that you can, please do. And, and offer to pray with them. I'm praying for you about this situation. You know, some of them would, would, would share a family issue with you and there is nothing you can do about it, but you can pray. You ask them, can I pray with you about this issue? As you are talking to me, I can see this is a burden on your heart. Um, I can't do anything about it, but I know that God is able to come through for you. Can I pray about this for you? Can I be praying with you about this situation? you never know how that will open the door for the gospel. I would say that talk to one Muslim at a time in personal evangelism. I always say this with some caution. If the spirit of the Lord is leading you to preach to them in a group, fair enough. But I will, it is best in practice to speak to one Muslim at a time. Engage one Muslim at a time. You see, when you try to witness to them in a group, it will turn to an argument. When one of them sees that, you know, their brother or sister is receptive to your message, they will bring arguments. They will try to distract the person and all this, 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 this uh, uh, disrupt the attention of the person. So as much as possible, do one-on-one, -on -one, target one person at a time and, and share the gospel with them. I say become the Muslim in order to win him or her for Christ. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 23, sorry, it's supposed to be um, 19 to 23, um, Paul says that, I become all sins to all men, so that by all means I will win some for Christ. He says, to the Jew, I became a Jew. To the Gentile, I became a Gentile. To the weak, I became like one who is weak. To the, one, to the person under the law, I became like one under the law, so that by all means... I will win some for Christ. I'm not saying that go and become a Muslim, go and recite the Shahada and, and, and convert to become a Muslim. No. Respect the things that they respect. You know, if you have a, a hard copy of the Quran, I, I would even advise that don't even carry it with you when you go to witness to Muslims. You can download a soft copy of the Quran on your phone. That way, you are not touching the Quran. You, would, you will not be required to have ablution before you touch the Quran. So be sensitive in, in how you engage with them. Um, and if you are in a Muslim dominated area, make sure that you present yourself in a way that you don't become suspicious. And then when Muslims ask you questions, they have certain objections. Respond to them with short, concise, and respectful answers. You know, don't use, don't be sarcastic in your responses. Don't use some negative terminologies and phrases. Show respect to them. And remember that your goal is not to win an argument, but to gain a friend and a hearing for the gospel. So as much as possible, avoid going into an argument with Muslims. Sometimes Muslims deliberately do this. 
they want to turn the conversation into an argument. If you feel that the conversation is becoming an argument, quickly apologize to them. Say, no, brother or sister, I, 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 I'm not here to argue with you. I'm sorry if I've said something which has offended you. I'm sorry. Um, did I say something which offended you? You know, don't go into an argument with them because all that you are seeking to do is to gain a hearing for the gospel. And that should be your, your, your focus. Show respect to Allah, Muhammad, Islam, and the Quran. Now, what do we mean by that? Don't say things that will annoy them. Don't do things that will irritate them. Try as much as possible to avoid that. Like I told you, when you mention Muhammad's name, you can say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a sign of respect. If you don't know how to say it in Arabic, say, peace be upon him. Just so you can engage on the conversation. Just so you can engage on the, in the conversation. Use the Quran to gain attention and respect, but don't use it as the word of God. Now, what I'm saying is that if you have read the Quran and you want to use it to show what it says about Jesus, like I pointed it to you, you can use that. You can use that. But remember that you are not well versed in it. You are not, you are not authoritative in it to use. So don't use it as the word of God. The Bible is your authoritative word. And then learn to recite a few verses of the Quran in Arabic. This is not compulsory. If you don't know any Arabic, forget about this. Use the Bible and, and, and use it to point it to people. Make sure that if you are going to quote some verses from the Quran, make sure that the verses you are quoting are relevant to the subject matter and the discussion. You're not going to let me. Don't, don't just quote verses. Make sure they are relevant for the discussion. Don't say something that will, that will offend them or that will lead to an argument. Don't use the Quran if you don't know how, if you are not well versed in it. Don't witness to a Muslim woman alone if you are a man. And don't witness to a man alone if you are a woman. You know that Islam is very gender sensitive. So I would advise that women or ladies should witness to women or ladies, and then men or gentlemen should witness to gentlemen or men. Gender sensitivity, please. And then don't ask or allow a Muslim woman convert to give her testimony in front of a Muslim audience. So if you are having a program in the neighborhood, if it is only Christian, assuming this is a Christian gathering, so I can share my testimony, or if I have a Muslim convert, I can let the person share their testimony. But don't do that in public where you know other Muslims are there and you want to show them that somebody has converted and all that, so they should come and share their testimony. No, 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 no. It will lead to a lot of conflict. So don't do that. Now, what are some of the objections that Muslims have about the Christian faith? We won't be able to go through this, but I just want to mention some of them and you can prepare yourself for it. Some of the objections they have, they have objections about the Trinity. They have objections about the deity and sonship of Christ. They have objections about the authenticity of the Bible and the necessity of the cross and the resurrection. Muslims don't believe that Jesus died and, and resurrected and all that. They don't believe in it. So this, these are some of the ways to, to, to witness to Muslims. And I pray that you, you would be able to apply them in, in your engagement and God would use you as his ambassador for Christ. Thank you and God bless you. Uh, thank you, Brother Ibrahim.